this love that makes me new oh may my heart receive this love that carries me from the head to the heart you take me on a journey of letting go getting lost in you from the head to the heart you take me on a journey of letting go getting lost in you thanks for joining us
sing about the love that will never fail. Love is patient, love is kind. It has no arrogance or pride. It seeks the good of others first. It keeps no record of wrong or hurt. No joy in wickedness, but rejoices in the truth. Through it all, love will endure. Love will never fail. Love is patient, love is kind It has no arrogance or pride It seeks the good of others first It keeps no record of wrong or hurt it finds no joy in a wickedness Says in the truth, and through it all, love will endure. Love will never fail. Prophecy will see, though all knowledge it will fade, and oh, an end will come to speech, and even death will pass away. We will see you face to face. Faith and hope they will remain And love will never fail Love will never, never fail Love will never, never fail My name is Deborah Wu Miller, and I am the Ministry Operations Associate here at the River Church, and it is my pleasure to give our welcome this morning. We are so glad that you've joined us, whether it's your first time or you tune in weekly. 
whether you're on your couch in your PJs or dressed up in your Sunday best just because, whether you're live on Sunday morning or watching this at a time later in your schedule that works better for you, no matter where you're at, we are glad that you are here and that you have joined us. Before we get started this morning, we have a quick announcement video. Hi, I'm Christine Rose with The River, and I wanted to share with you some of the great work that The River is doing in our local community. The River is partnering with City Team to support residents at The Willows, which is an apartment complex very close to where The River meets. Residents at The Willows, um, many of them are having a, a lot of financial difficulty, and so being able to provide distribution of food twice a month has been a real help to the residents. Especially with COVID hitting, their need is greater than ever. I'd love to share with you a little bit about the work we're doing, so we'd like to have you hear from a few of our volunteers. So I've been driving here uh, to the Willows, helping volunteer deliver food. Um, and there's been several of us that have been able to drive. It's been a really cool experience this far. Um, the community here is really vibrant, and the people here are really friendly and grateful for uh, the food that they get. So it's it's been a really enjoyable experience this far. Uh, plus I've got to fulfill a childhood dream of driving a large truck full of food. <laughs> Delivering food to the families that are in these apartments um, is a really fun way that we can help out in our community. Um, a lot of people are really struggling right now so um, any way that we can find that our family can help others uh, is, is really beneficial. If you're interested in becoming involved, a couple of details. First of all, we do the food distribution the second and fourth Wednesday of every month. We arrive at the Willows at 7 and we're usually finished by 7.30 p.m., so pretty quick. If you're interested in learning more, please reach out to myself, Christine Rose, and both my email and my phone information is here on your screen. I'd love to hear from you and have you join us. Thank you. Last week, Brad started our new fall series where we're going to journey through the book of Luke, and we are looking at the theme of renewal. If you haven't had a chance to listen yet, I encourage you to go watch it later on YouTube or listen on our podcast, as Brad reminds us that Luke has the promise that renewal is held out for each of us, even in the midst of the darkest times. Jason will join us soon to bring um, this week's message on renewal, but first I wanted to remind you that we are introducing back into our live stream the practice of communion. When we met together in person, this was something we did every week as a reminder that Christ's sacrifice is central to our life of faith and our life together in community, so we thought it was an important element to incorporate into our live stream. In order to participate, you'll need some supplies. So you'll wanna grab some crackers and some juice, and hopefully this will start to become part of your routine as you get ready to settle in for Sunday morning. I'm now trying to grab my journal, and then the favorite of my house is Triscuits and orange juice, and have those ready for when it's time for communion. Before Jason comes, let me pray for us. And I'm actually going to read a prayer that one of our sisters up in the East Bay wrote this week in response um, to the fires that are ravaging the West Coast. Creator God, by the kinetic force of your abundant love, you created sun and moon, day and night, dream skies and seas, swarms and species, formed us out of dust and called us good. You called us to steward, to tend, to notice, to care for your earth like you care for us, and we failed. Forgive us for our greed, our insatiable appetites, leading to extraction and exploitation. Forgive us for trampling the earth that holds us, for abusing your resources that sustain us, for harming the most vulnerable among us for neglecting the generations coming after us, for living as if we are beyond consequence. On this day of hazardous skies, as the earth warns us to slow down, to take heed and caution, 
Help us to lament. Teach us to listen. Give us the urgency to change our ways before there is no more earth to enjoy. Because all of creation has been consumed, we pray in the power of your spirit. Amen. Well, hello. It's good to be with you all today. Uh, If you were with us last week, Brad began to introduce us to the biblical theme of renewal. And renewal is just this idea that it's Jesus's passion to take the old, the broken, the tarnished things in our lives and make them new until that day when all things are going to be renewed. Put another way, my friend James Chung says that renewal is a season of breakthroughs that ushers in a new normal. And I feel like 2020 has been the year of new normals, hasn't it? Feels like every time that we get acclimated to some new change, something comes right behind it, right? I think about like, you know, six months ago, if you can remember that long ago, we were told like, stay home, wear a mask, wipe down your groceries, and it was freaky, but we acclimated and we got our masks and we got, we set up our home office and got used to Zoom. And then we a couple months went by and we're like, okay, this is going to be here for a while, and, uh, you know, we, how are we going to entertain ourselves? Well, let's get outside. We'll go hiking and biking and walk in the neighborhood. And then a couple weeks ago, all of a sudden, you can't go outside. And this week, the sky is orange. And there's this sense of, like, you can't go outside. It's dangerous to breathe. So now we're sitting at home in one room with an AC if you have it on. And uh, you've piled the kids in if you have those, and you're putting them in front of the distance learning or the, the Disney Plus, and you're trying to get your Zoom calls done. Gosh, we just keep trying to acclimate. And all of this new normal has been precipitated by all of these experiences of breakdown. But renewal is this experience of a new normal that comes from breakthrough. It's when God shows up in our life and everything changes. And that, my friends, is a good thing, right? The dead places in our life come to life. The broken things are healed. It's where our lives and our church and our culture begin to really reflect the kingdom of God. In this season, where we are continuously hitting our limits and coming present to our need, feeling in touch with how much breakdown there is in our world, a season of breakthrough that ushers in a new normal of the kingdom seems like a great thing. And so if you're like me, there's a sense of like, yes, sign me up. I want that. That sounds awesome. But then we quickly discover or find, well, how do we do that? How do we get that? How do we participate in God's renewing work? Well, depending on your temperament, you might be tempted to lean one way or the other. For those of you sort of type A, goal setter type folks, there's this sense of like, well, if I just get clarity on my goal and reorganize my life and get disciplined, it will happen. So applied to renewal, let's just get my spiritual disciplines figured out, read my Bible more, pray more, and that investment will yield this renewing work of God. Others of us might lean more towards this kind of go with the flow, spontaneity, the sense that like we are resigned to the divine hand of God, and if he wants renewal in our life, well, it'll just happen. And today, I want to suggest that what if neither of those postures are really the answer? That we see in scripture that, well, we can't make renewal happen just by our disciplined efforts or our religious activity. And we also don't just sit back and let it unfold, but we have a role to play. This fall, we've been, we're going to be journeying through the gospel of Luke in its entirety, paying attention to this theme of renewal. And uh, I want to encourage you on Sundays, we're going to be listening in on the odd chapters of Luke. And I want to just invite you throughout the week to be engaging the even chapters. And if you'd like help doing that, I encourage you to check out a small group. Our small groups are going to be following that rhythm. But today we're going to pick up in Luke chapter 5, and I want to um, help us think about the passage we're coming to today from the lens of how, what does this passage tell us about how to participate in God's work of renewal? So here's where we find ourselves as we open Luke 5. Jesus has been teaching, and his teaching is so good, this crowd is gathered, and it's too big to be inside anywhere, so they go outside. And uh, to take advantage of the kind of natural acoustics, Jesus finds this guy named uh, Simon, who's a fisherman, and he says, hey, can I get on your boat and teach? And here's what happens. Verse 4 says, when he finished speaking, 
He said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. Let's pause here for just a second. Uh, This is kind of an odd interaction and maybe even a little bit offensive. Uh, Jesus, this newly minted, untrained rabbi, son of a carpenter, is telling Simon, this seasoned, professional, uh, lifelong fisherman, how to do his job. You know that feeling when somebody tells you how to run your life and they're maybe not as adept or skilled as they think. It's an irritating feeling. So you could imagine how Simon might be feeling. And so I read that. It's it's tempting to want to read into this experience that Simon is a little sarcastic. The sense of like, okay, Jesus, well, we've been uh, out all night and uh, we've been in that deep and there's no fish. It's a dud. But if you say so, all right, fine. We'll go. We'll go back out, right? I think it's possible that Simon is irritated and maybe a little bit uh, sarcastic, but the fact remains he's obedient, right? Jesus is inviting him to do something uh, a little illogical, a little crazy, to to do the same thing over again and hope for a different result. So why would Simon go along with that? Well, literally right before this, he was hearing Jesus teach, and Jesus' teaching was with authority, the text tells us. The crowd was lauding Jesus for his impressive teaching with authority. And just the night before, uh, Jesus had showed up unannounced at Simon's house, and he'd come and he'd healed his wife's mother. So Simon, it seems like Simon is uh, open to the possibility that Jesus' authority as a teacher and Jesus' authority as a healer could be transferred into this sort of arena or compartment of his life. I wonder how it is for you as you're beginning to ponder the theme of renewal. I wonder... Uh, if you could imagine Jesus doing something similar in your life. You know, our lives really are uh, his best as we try not to make it. Our lives tend to function in compartments. And I wonder as you take stock of your life at home or in your professional life or in your spiritual life, what feels stuck? What feels dry or destitute or broken that needs a fresh touch from Jesus? I have to tell you, it's been a weird journey for my family and I coming back to San Jose. We moved here not even a year ago. We moved back in around Thanksgiving time. And it was, you know, the craziness of the holidays and people were busy doing things. And uh, we came to uh, the new year, January, with this intention of, all right, we're going to get out there, dip our feet in the community. We're going to make some friends and find our place here. And then the world stopped. And uh, it's kind of been like we've been on an island, this sort of weird digital island where we tune in online to our workplaces and to have some relationships that way. But when we close the computers, we feel like we're just severed off and disconnected uh, from a lot of the world and the world here. And I know I'm not alone in this feeling of isolation or loneliness. For those of you that live alone, for those of you that are far from family, for those of you that um, maybe are in an intense experience of self-quarantine for whatever reason, I know you can connect to that. And whatever it is, whether it's there's dissatisfaction in your relational life or in some other arena, I wonder if we could begin to open that possibility that just like Simon, Jesus wants to surprise us with his authority in that place. So let's see what happens when they get out on the water. Verse 6 says, When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and to help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. Ever since I was a kid, I have loved this passage. I love like the chaos of it. Like I always have pictured like fish flapping around and flying all over the place and Simon freaking out, like just grabbing his net and just trying to pull it together. And then I see Jesus kind of in the middle of it all, um, kind of with this like playfulness, maybe a smile on his face, almost like a, a parent watching their child rip through all the presents on Christmas morning. And as I think about this passage in light of renewal, it's not just the playfulness that stands out to me, but actually the geography. You see, Jesus had, is taking Simon back to an old familiar place. And Simon, don't forget, as a fisherman, he would know this lake inside and out. He would know all the different fishing spots. He would know where, what, you know, where the, where the fish swim and where the, where the wind, you know, how it hits that and the color of the water and how deep it is. He would know sort of every nook and cranny of this lake. And so when Jesus shows up, you know, prior to this, Simon's been out all night. You know, he's taken apart his nets, no fish all night. And then Jesus shows up, and all of a sudden, Jesus is like, let's go back to that place. And boom, there's a breakthrough, tons of fish, right? 
And it's easy to overlook the significance of this moment for Simon, but man, when Jesus shows up in his life, everything changes. The financial payout from this singular catch would completely change Simon's life. He now would have like this crazy capital to invest back into his business. I'm sure he could hire new hands and build new boats and move himself out of manual labor and into management, and he's kind of set. And lest we think that when Jesus shows up in our life that it's all about prosperity, you know, spoiler alert, but later in this passage, Simon walks away from all of that. Why would he do that? You see, Jesus shows up and it changes everything. And Jesus loves to show up and do a new thing in an old place. As we lean into this idea of renewal, I think it's possible that we could be kind of become captive to cynicism, the sense that God can't do a new thing in this old part of my life sort of been there, done that, right? I've been longing for a breakthrough in this place for so long, no change. I've been showing up to small group every week, bringing this same prayer request. Nothing's happening. Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Perhaps, like Simon, you feel a little callous to the possibility of renewal. A number of years ago, when I first began to interact with this idea of renewal, a friend of mine invited me to think about a person or a place in my life that just felt so spiritually void and so untouched by God that I just couldn't even imagine that God could do a new thing there. And I just immediately, I thought of my sister who uh, in college very intentionally walked away from her faith. And as I thought about this experience of renewal in her life, I just had this sense that if God could do like a renewing work in her, if that actually could happen, then God could do like anything, anything in my life or around me. And so every spring, um, for a long time now, during the season of Lent, I go into this posture of very intentionally praying for like spiritual renewal in my sister's life. And I pray specifically for two things, that God would use the people in her community to express his heart for her, and that God would use her children to have an impact on her. And so for the last 10 years, I've been praying this, And there's been nothing, no movement. It's felt like a very discouraging experience to show up every spring and pray for this. But then, just a couple months ago, during this quarantine season, something weird started to happen. I started getting these text messages from my sister, and they were like, hey, Jason, I'm feeling really anxious today. Can you pray for me? Or, hey, Jason, we've got this situation with the kids. We don't know what to do. Can you just send up a prayer for us? And it was like so out of character and so odd in our relationship, that I finally just kind of picked up the phone and called her. And I was like, hey, Liz, like, what's happening for you? Like, this is just really different. I'm just curious, like, what's happening for you right now? And she said to me, you know what, Jason? I don't know why, but I feel like I'm being drawn back to my faith. And when she said that, uh, it was, it just kind of immediately I thought about all the prayers and all the time of waiting and believing for God to do a new thing in this place in her life. And then she said two things that really stood out to me. The first, she said that, well, there's this family that's kind of adopted them. They see they had just moved to a new place kind of outside of New York City, and there was this family from a local church that was coming over every week and bringing them groceries and just welcoming them and caring for them um, as as new people in the community. And she was really moved by that as an expression of God. And then second, she said that her daughter, her five-year-old daughter, was taking this newfound interest in Jesus and wanted to read about the story of Jesus. And my sister recounted this story of one day going outside and seeing a rainbow, and my niece just saying, Mom, that rainbow is just a picture that, you know, God wants you to know he loves you. And there was just this overwhelming sense that, for me, that God is at work in her life, and this reminder that God really can and loves to do a new thing in an old place. And so I wonder what it is for you. I wonder if there's an old place in your life, a place that feels familiar and feel so sort of stagnant that you can't imagine God doing a new thing there. Can you think of a place like that? Maybe it's, you know, a friend or a family member or a neighbor. Maybe it's a dream that you had for your life, a dream for your, your job or your contribution to society that just hasn't panned out how you expected. Or maybe it's just sort of a heaviness in your own spiritual life that just feels like it's been there for a long time. Whatever it is, I think this passage reminds us that God's passion is to do a new thing in an old place, and that when he shows up, everything changes. Can you open yourself up to that possibility? There's one more crucial thing I wanted to see in this passage before we close, 
And it's Simon's response. You know, we would expect Simon to be thrilled and overwhelmed and just joyful over this great catch of fish. But look what happens in verse 8. It says, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, go away from me, Lord, I am, a, I am a sinful man. What's going on for Simon? Like, why does he react this way? I mean, clearly Simon is in touch with Jesus' authority, right? We, we saw that he's impressed by the teaching. He's seen demons cast out. He's seen his own family members healed by Jesus. And there's this, maybe a sense that while Jesus is sort of out there being Jesus to other people, there's a way in which Simon can formulate his perception of who Jesus is without having to really change. But when Jesus takes all that authority and that power and brings it into the deepest part of Simon's life, well, that's where things get super real, super fast. You know, we don't know a lot about Simon's backstory, but we can speculate. And I kind of wonder if maybe for Simon, this moment, this experience on the fishing boat is a lot like my experience with my sister. This kind of this beacon or sign that God is alive and at work. You know, what if, is it possible that Simon's business was on the brink of failure and that his, his sort of deepest concern right now was his financial stability and the, the, the breakdown of his business might have been creating all this pressure at home and this feeling that I'm not a good provider, a good father. And then on top of that, he's dealing with maybe the, the realities of being oppressed by the Romans and there's this, maybe this breakdown or deconstruction of, is God, this God that I know, the God of Israel, really a redeeming God? Maybe Simon's on the verge of a crisis of faith. Maybe he's about ready to walk away from it all. And in, what if in that place, it's Jesus showing up? That actually Jesus showing up on the boat is a really tender and fragile place for him, for Simon. And I wonder how that would hit him. I wonder if he, you know, every plan, every, there's a sense of being really exposed. Like every plan, every sort of fear, every expectation he had to sort of walk away maybe from his faith. All of a sudden, Jesus is confronting that pretty intensely. You know, what's happening here is actually an expression of confession. In a moment of deep knowing, Simon is coming to recognize something profound about Jesus. And then when we begin to see God more clearly, we see ourselves more clearly. This is what happens whenever God shows up in someone's life in Scripture. I think about uh, Isaiah. And for Isaiah, when God showed up in his life, he said, Woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips. We began our time together today by asking, how do we participate in renewal? And the answer is rather simple. We begin in a, in a posture of confession. When we become honest with our deepest needs and our deepest longings and hold those before God, it begins to open the door to Jesus' renewing work. This is always what happens. This is what we see later in chapter 5. Uh, immediately after this story, there's a, um, a leper that comes to Jesus and he is you know, he's aware of his sickness and his uncleanliness. He says, Jesus, if you are will willing, you can make me clean. And then immediately after that, these friends bring their, uh, their friend who's paralyzed, and they bring him to Jesus, and they just say, Jesus, our friend needs your help. And Jesus says, because of your faith, your sins are forgiven. And then the, the, the chapter ends with Jesus going into the house of a sinner, a tax collector, and he reminds all the people there, he says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. You see, renewal begins when we come to a posture of confessing our sickness and our need for a healing touch from God. Fundamentally, it's about relinquishing control. Confession is a posture of surrender. For so many of us, confession reminds us of like our childhood, sort of that feeling of doing something wrong, getting caught with your hand in the cookie jar, and all the guilt and the shame gets stirred up, and it drives us away to want to isolate and disconnect from relationship. But biblical confession does exactly the opposite. When we look at who God is, and our light and who we are in light of that, there's a way in which we just come to a greater dependency and we actually feel drawn into greater intimacy with God because he wants to draw close to us in that very state. Renewal begins where we end and it begins where, when we stop trying to renew ourselves and we ask God to do it. In this passage, Jesus shows up and changes everything for Simon. It's the first of a season of breakthroughs that usher in a completely new normal for his life. And it starts precisely when he confesses his need and his longing for God. I want to invite us into a similar experience. If you want to say yes to God's renewing work this year, I want to invite us to begin in a posture of confession. So as we transition to worship, I invite you to consider this question of reflection. 
What area of your life feels untouched by God? Could you confess your desire to give it to God and to wait with anticipation of his renewing touch? sadness from wherever you've been come broken hearted let rescue begin come find your mercy oh sinner come near earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal earth has no sorrow that heaven So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame, and all who are broken, lift up your face, oh wanderer, come. too far so lay down your hurt lay down your heart come as you are there's hope for the hopeless and all those who've strayed come sit at the table come taste the grace Rest for the weary, rest that endure. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can cure. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. And all who are broken. up your faith Oh wanderer come home You're not too far So lay down your hurt Lay down your heart Come as you are There's joy for the morning, oh sinner, be still. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. joy for the morning oh sinner be still earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal earth has no sorrow that heaven
the song that we just sang together invites us to come to the table and to taste the grace of God. That's what we do in the celebration of communion. You know, Jason declared good news to us in two parts. One is that Jesus has come into our dark and broken world with power and authority and passion to make all things new. And the second and important piece is that we mysteriously can become part of that renewing work in as much as we confess our need, confess the burdens that we're carrying, and confess our sins. And we can confess all of those things when we come to this table because this table reminds us that there is great mercy in the heart of God. When Jesus died, suffered on a Roman cross, when he allowed his body to be broken and his blood to be poured out, the scriptures tell us that he died a death for you and for me to wash away all of our sins, to unburden us of everything that weighs us down and to heal all of our diseases. That's what we do when we come and eat this meal together. I want to tell you that nobody should be pressured today to receive this meal on the one hand. So if you don't feel ready for that, you can just take this time to reflect on the invitation of Jesus to you. But I also want to say that there's generosity in the heart of Jesus Nobody needs to be a holy person to receive this meal. One only needs to be humble enough to confess their sins and hungry enough to receive into their very being the very presence and leadership of Jesus who is alive. At this point in our service, if you're with family members or in a household, you are welcome to serve one another the bread and the cup. And if you are not with friends today, allow me the honor of saying these sacred words to you. This is the body of Christ, and it is broken for you. And this is the blood of Christ, and it is poured out for you. The invitation of Jesus is to come with glad and sincere hearts to receive these gifts and buy them to be healed, and to be made new. As you receive these gifts, allow me to pray for each and every one of you. Spirit of God, pour your presence out upon these simple elements, bread, juice, wine, whatever it is that we have, and make them to be for us the body and blood of your presence given for the renewal of the whole world, given for the renewal of of each and every one of us. Be blessed, my friends, as you receive these gifts. And after you do, there will be a slide that comes up with some reflection questions before we enter back into worship. I invite you, if you're with friends, to share out one of these questions with one another. Or if you're alone and you'd like to reconnect with someone, text one of our staff, one of your friends, an answer to one of these questions and enjoy your participation in the community of God's people.
So friends, today we've been talking about this idea of renewal and how we begin to enter into it. And as we just take a look around our world, take around a look at our life, I mean, just the very fact that it's hard to take a deep breath in the air that we're walking around in right now is just a sign to us, a sign that we just need a a new normal. We need um, God to usher in something new. And so all the things that you'll be facing this week, um, it's our hope, it's our encouragement that, that God would breathe new life into that, that God would come and begin his renewing work. And that, we, that would begin in us as we just come to our own place of confession and just saying, opening our hands and saying, God, we need you afresh. So if that's your desire today, that you just would like to, that fresh breath of God, I invite you just to, to open your hands, take a deep breath, and receive this blessing. I bless you in the name of the Father and the Holy, Son and the Holy Ghost today to receive a 
a fresh breath and fresh wind of God's presence in your life, in our city and in our world. And I pray as we come in touch with our deep need for God, that God will come and reveal himself in greater measure. I bless you to go in the strength and the peace of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for being with us today, and we look forward to seeing you again.